Hi, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm one of the hosts of STEM in 30, a television program for middle school students that is produced at the National Air and Space Museum. This month, we are celebrating 20 years of continuous human presence aboard the International Space Station. Today, we are going to be talking about science being done on the International Space Station. If you're watching, we invite you to submit your questions live into the comment section and we'll take as many as we can get during this period. Uh, and if we also want to know where you're watching from, so tell us and we'll try and give you a shout out as well. Today, I am joined by Timothy J. Kramer or TJ Kramer, uh, NASA flight director and NASA astronaut. Welcome, TJ. Thank you, ma'am. Good to be here. I also have Brock Howe, project manager at NanoRocks. Brock, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. And Sarah Quanzi, who is a NASA, I did I say it wrong? Quasi. <laughs> Uh, I do it all the time. I'm always looking at names. Uh, NASA Program Integration. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Uh, let's start uh, by uh, asking TJ. Uh, TJ, science is one of the most important functions on the International Space Station. Can you tell us why it's so important to do science on the ISS? You're asking a great question because a lot of times you begin to wonder, can't we do research on the ground also? And, and the truth is we do do research on the ground. Um, the purpose we go to the space station, the, the reason why we're in orbit, we're always in free fall. And this puts our laboratory where we can do these experiments in a very special condition where we can remove the effect of gravity from the equation, from the experiment. Um, gravity can be a very dominant feature of experiments here on the ground. Uh, so if we remove gravity, we can get to see what the other processes are and what may be the dominant uh, inf influencers uh, involving um, the experiment. Let me give you an example. On the ground, you can have a very romantic dinner and the, the candle flame that's on your table burns in its traditional teardrop shape. This is a gravity effect. The cold air on the outside pushes down. The warmer air is then displaced, driven up. The flame elongates. It's a great way to, to, to show the effect of, of what the airflow and the air currents can do, but it disturbs the perfect environment to, exp to explore the combustion of the flame. So I take that flame to orbit. I now no longer have the gravity effect affecting the experiment. And now all of a sudden the flame burns as a perfect symmetric sphere. It burns for a short time, but nonetheless, it's a sphere. It's undisturbed by convection. So now I can perfectly probe the perfect combustion environment. Taking ex science experiments to uh, orbit, to do on the space station, I can now remove the gravity effects and look a little bit deeper, significantly deeper into the processes that are going on. And that's the reason why we do science experiments on board and we turn those effects around to help what we do on the earth, for instance, for um, understanding better combustion processes for internal combustion engines. They can burn cleaner for factories so they don't put out as much soot anymore or go the other way to understand the better extinction processes of the flame so, so you can have better fire retardant clothing. Go to orbit, remove gravity, we have results that we can use to make life better here on Earth and also to go farther away. Brock, you're working on a really exciting project called the Bishop Airlock Module. Do you want to tell us what that is? So the, the Bishop Airlock Module is, a, is an expansion to the ISS. So we're building a brand new airlock that, go, that we're going to put on board the space station here in just a few weeks when it launches on SpaceX 21, uh, launching on a SpaceX Falcon rocket. So um, as TJ commented about, we've been, and, and you had mentioned earlier in the program, we're at celebrating 20 years of the International Space Station doing science. And what's really cool is that we're still adding new components. We're expanding that capability um, and giving uh, even more opportunities for scientists to be able to do work on board the space station. So now it's not just 20 years and it's the same 
uh, world-class laboratory that it was uh, at the start. Now we're continuing to expand and doing more things with her. So uh, the Bishop Airlock is going to expand on those capabilities. We're going to get a little bit more down in the details of how the airlock works, but it's a brand new module for the space station uh, that flies just here in a couple of weeks on the next uh, SpaceX Falcon rocket. Sarah, tell us about some of the science applications we can expect from this airlock uh, that will be sent to the ISS. Sure, so really one of the biggest benefits of the airlock is that it enables science uh, that couldn't be performed if the airlock wasn't there. So it allows scientists to become uh, more creative than ever before because of this extra space. It's, as, as Brock mentioned, um, it's an expansion to the existing world-class laboratory we already have uh, in low Earth orbit and it provides more room to do more experiments, a bigger door to get hardware in and out of the, the ISS, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and vice versa, and a platform to host some of these experiments from, uh, from space, unlike any other area on board the ISS. You know, a few of the possibilities that we've been looking at include, uh, excuse me, deployment of satellites that are larger than the CubeSats deployed now, Translation of, of larger experiments from inside the ISS to outside the ISS. Technology demonstrations of space equipment, such as new space telescopes and even on-orbit manufacturing using the airlock. Uh, as of today, I think, and Brock can definitely help me if I say any of this incorrectly, um, both NASA and ESA have purchased, uh, pre-purchased some use of the NanoRax airlock. There's a new user, a uh, space robotics startup company called Gatai, that is going to be launching a robotic, uh, a robot actually, that's going to be performing experiments in the airlock. And there's uh, other commercial companies that are just waiting in the wings to come forward. So we're really excited about this. It sounds really exciting. And we have a lot of people watching uh, from Oregon, Virginia, Washington, DC, California, Missouri, North Carolina, New Jersey. Um, Alexander, age six, is watching from Maine. Haley and Riley are in Oakland Park, Illinois. Christian from Alaska. And we've actually got a lot of schools. Uh, Mrs. S, sixth grade class in Annandale. Uh, Mrs. Stasel's third grade class from Wyoming, Georgia. Mrs. Gash's fifth grade class at Stone Creek Elementary in Derby, Can uh, Kansas. Navarre Middle School in South Bend, um, India, uh, Indiana. And let's get to some of the questions we have. Um, a fifth grader in Central Texas wants to know, are, are we growing plants on the space station? And if so, how are they doing? And so that question is for... Anyone who wants to take a picture of you can up there. Were you growing plants when you were up there? So... Um, so the first thing I would say is during my time when I was up there, late 2009, 2010, we were doing plant experiments and we were growing um, little fir trees to see how the fir trees would, uh, would ingest the water and the nutrients basically, and to see how they would do in, in, in the encapsulated little um, experimental section. But today we're actually growing uh, radishes and we think they'll, they'll be ready for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we've done other experiments for edible plants to include lettuce and and a variety of uh, varials, uh, varietals. Um, and the whole key thing here is when we go farther away from the planet Earth, we want to be able to sustain our, our, our folks that are going for the longer missions and be able to, to do some farming wherever you go, basically, whether it's still on a, a orbital platform or whether it's actually on the surface someplace. So understanding the plant processes. See, there, there you go. There's my little... Uh, spruce springs <laughs> that I'm playing with. Um, the, um, uh, the Be able to understand how the plants behave both in the microgravity environment as well as in, in new soil environments. So yeah, we're growing plants today on, on Space Station. Hey, Brock, somebody would like to know, how are you going to get this module? You said it's going to go on the Dragon, but how, how are you going to get it there? Is it like you just throw your luggage in your trunk or... Uh... <laughs> Essentially, that's a great segue into that. So it, we will be flying what they call the dragon trunks. I have a little model here. 
It's kind of a, sim, uh, a smaller version, of course, the uh, SpaceX Falcon uh, uh, Dragon vehicle. So the top end of the section here is the um, uh, what they call the pressurized uh, cabin or capsule for the uh, SpaceX Dragon vehicle. The very front end is the docking ring that attaches to the space station. And if we turn it around on the back end, we got this section in the back, what we call the trunk. And in the back of the trunk is actually, we have a model here of our airlock. So we call this, uh, we affectionately call her mini airlock. So she's a 120th scale version of the actual airlock. And she will fit down inside of the Dragon trunk for launch. So it will launch flying uphill to the space station. She will dock with the space station. And then the robot arm will come in reach in and grab the airlock out and then maneuver and place this on board um, the International Space Station. To give you an idea of scale, I brought along a little friend of Mini Airlock, the space band, the Lego figure. He is, yes, to scale because we are uh, full engineers down here and we fully embrace our, our uh, space nerdiness. So if you look at the airlock with the Lego man in there, that gives you an idea of the size of the airlock. So, um, yeah, so that's exactly how we're going to fly uphill uh, to the space station. But Sarah, I think this is probably a question for you. Uh, what kind of experiments are you looking forward to seeing being done in the airlock? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, honestly, I'm really excited to see how this robot's going to do. Um, I, I'm, I, I love robotics and, uh, and with Gitai, some of the demonstrations we've seen, um, which you can find on the internet, some of the demonstrations we've seen, I mean, he's reaching into a Ziploc bag and pulling out, I forget if they were M&Ms or Skittles, but it's very delicate work. And, and while you look at it in 1G here on, on Earth, um, you know, it's, it's, it looks easy, but when you're in space in the, in the um, microgravity environment, it's very difficult because these little, these little Skittles or M&Ms are starting to float. And so you've got to reach in and be very precise in your movements. And so that's one that I am super excited to see more of because I think that the, uh, the uses of that are just going to be phenomenal once we get that, that technology working. We have, we've got a lot of schools watching today. Uh, we've got a uh, micro school in Phoenix, Arizona, Mrs. Goodnight's first grade class, homeschoolers in Virginia, Mrs. Amos's class in Mount Pleasant, Chesapeake, Virginia, Mrs. Uh, Chatt Chattleton's class in Riverside, California, this is my third grade class, and we've got a lot of students watching to keep those, keep those questions coming in. Um, and TJ, I think this one's probably uh, best directed at you. Um, what, what sort of um, animal experiments have been done in space? I know that there have been some uh, arachnids and insects and mice sent up. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? So we, we've had um, s several, and you've named a couple already. Um, we had some students who submitted the jumping spiders to see how they would adapt to microgravity, and that was an interesting little demonstration of basically a species adapting to a new environment. Um, we've had some fish up there and engaged in, and there was a Japanese experiment. Um, and, of course, we've got uh, some rodent experiments that are going on um, have been going on for a while, and with this next launch of SpaceX 21, I think we're bringing up uh, something on the order of 40 mice, I think it is. Um, and, and the studies are basically how the, how these animals can, can adapt to a microgravity, uh, what the microgravity environment does to the physiology, uh, why. If we travel to Mars, for instance, the shortest leg to get to Mars the shortest leg is a six month journey. So we want to understand what's going to happen to our bodies during the microgravity trip to Mars. We don't want to hurt ourselves and we want to be able to combat the bad effects that microgravity may be um, causing our bodies to have. So we study the mice to see how we do, um, how, how they end up uh, evolving, how they end up experiencing bone loss, for instance, how their cardiac system um, adapts to or doesn't to microgravity so that we can have an idea of how the astronauts will be um, uh, experiencing that trip and, and can we help them prevent bad things happening to their bodies. 
similarly, if I may, the bone loss uh, studies that we're doing with the mice also are um, specifically advantageous for our bone loss that we experience as humans as we age. We don't want the osteoporosis uh, to be affecting the larger and larger uh, percentages of the population. So we want to understand that process and microgravity gives us that opportunity to do that. Uh, Brock, we're just going to have to address this head on. Everybody wants to know if that's <laughs> back there. And uh, what say, say that. Everybody wants to know if that's Baby Yoda sitting behind you and why is it sitting there? Okay, yes, that is Baby Yoda. And, uh, of course, uh, Mandalorian is a, is a big hit with uh, a lot of our engineering team. And uh, we actually had Baby Yoda with us um, uh, throughout the testing of the airlock. So over the last uh, eight months or so, we did a lot of testing right in our clean room that's right behind me. So this is the spacecraft fabrication area for Nanoracks, the company I work for. And we did all the... Um, uh, airlock testing and checkout, pre-flight checkout uh, here in this facility. So we had Baby Yoda as our good luck charm. Um, uh, she was uh, with us the whole way, even followed us down to the Kennedy Space Center for integration into the uh, Dragon Trunk at uh, in Florida. And so she was uh, really escorting us along the whole way. So yes, uh, and I know Baby Yoda is a big item right now with uh, being the zero G indicator for the Crew One launch that just launched this past weekend. So uh, yes, so we again lots of pictures of uh, of folks that came to visit and check out the airlock, just like the people that we have online today. There's Baby Yoda right there with our test engineers uh, uh, doing testing on the airlock in our clean room. So, uh, yeah, big supporter. And we also think that the airlock kind of looks like a Mandalorian helmet. You went to that one picture. So we dressed up the airlock as a uh, Mandalorian helmet for Halloween this year, right before we uh, uh, delivered her down to uh, Florida to put in the rocket. Well, I'm glad we got that cleared up because we have a lot more questions about Baby Yoda. Uh, yeah. We've got a lot more people watching from all over. Mrs. Fox, eighth grade class is watching. Uh, Delaware County, Pennsylvania Bio uh, Biomed program is watching today. Uh, Cub Scouts Pack 583 from Iowa is watching. Mrs. Dubois, sixth grade class is watching. So we've got we've got a lot of people watching. So keep those questions coming in. Um, Sarah, I think this may be a question for you. Um, how do you uh, train uh, the astronauts to do the science experiments in this uh, module? Is there a training process that they have to go through to use it? Absolutely, and um, I, I, we have done a lot of work uh, to get to that point. So the first thing the astronauts have to do is actually learn how to work in the module itself, um, because there's a lot of little plugins and, and attachment points and things like that. So we have to familiarize them with uh, the, the actual module itself. And that training is actually done in the mock-up that's right behind Brock over there. Um, this is uh, one of the, the first crew lessons that we had recently was uh, given to, to Kate, who's on ISS now. And we took her over to the Nanorax facility and she got inside of the mock-up that's there and, and we trained her on, on how to actually operate the airlock first. So once you have an understanding of the airlock itself, then once these new science experiments come on board, we can train each one of those new astronauts on um, how they'll interface with it, how they'll turn the power on, how they'll make sure that it's being videotaped correctly. Um, and we'll do, part of that will be done actually um, in the Huntsville facility and part of it will be done over at the Nanorex facility in the mock-up that's, uh, that's right behind Brock. It's, uh, it's really a neat process. That, that is really interesting. And I hadn't thought of like, once you get it up there, you know, it's, it's like, it's not, well, for me, it's like hooking up your television now, you know, cause you've got all these plugs and things that you have put in the right place or your, your streaming services won't work. And uh, during the right. pandemic, that's become quite, quite an issue. <laughs> yeah. um, You've also got to get lighting right in there as well, right? You've got to make sure the lighting's correct so you can see what you're doing and, again, videotaping. So, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, TJ, uh, someone would like to know, um, are there results of these experiments uh, somewhere that people can read up on that, you, that, you've been a, that you've done in space? 
So the, the answer is sure, certainly. Um, the experiments that we work on get published in their scientific journals of the, um, of the investigators and the, and the developers themselves. But the, the other thing you can do is if you go to the www.nasa.gov website and search for the, the science experiments that are, um, have been in the past, you'll be able to find out both the setup of the experiment and some of the abstracts that talk about uh, the, the um, conduct of the experiments and with, with some prognosis, yes. What was your favorite experiment to work on? Did you I, have to? Well, I had to cheat because of the picture we showed a little bit earlier was, was one, of the, one of the couple ones that I really enjoyed. Um, in that picture, you see me smiling, smiling with the, the green plants. But what is not really clear in the picture is that the air in space station tends to flow from the front of space station, the US modules, back through the hatches to the Russian segment and so you can see the plants, and and to my back, you can you can see a hatchway, and then there's a pink area, and then it goes back to the Russian segment. So literally, the first time I pulled out these spruce sprigs, I was doing the watering thing, and the plants have been in the air for a while. Our Russian compadres, Oleg, uh, came down and said, "What smells so good?" Um, so oftentimes we get asked what's the aroma like on space station and it's extremely clear and clean air. So, but when somebody is cooking something, you can smell the, the, the food that's being warmed. Brought these plants out and that's a completely different aroma that we don't typically get to, to experience on space station. And that was really why this gets to be one of the, the favorites, it's special. Uh, Brock, someone would like to know, um if there were any sort of uh, tools that you had to develop uh, for this, uh, for the module so that the astronauts can do experiments in there, is was there anything new that you had to come up with? Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll grab another model here, another little bit model that's a little more higher fidelity than what we had done before. And, uh, and uh, we got Spock here to help represent our crew member, TJ, if you will. And uh, so some of the things when, when the crew members will work actually inside of the airlock module. So one of the things that we do, we use some materials that are shown on these little ridges that are in here called seat track. Now that, that material is um, around a lot on the space station. They actually use it in airplanes too to fasten seats to the airliner. So it's, it's the word seat track. These are very easy to use uh, structures for the crew members to use so we like to use those kind of materials actually on the outside of the airlock you'll see a lot of gold uh, rails these are called handrails so if the astronaut has to go on a spacewalk they will use the handrails to maneuver around the airlock to different locations so yeah so there's lots of little pieces there just like sarah talked about the training by kate that had come over she gave us a lot of great feedback on and no, let's change this here. And so it was a good collaboration between Nanoracks, my company, and our design engineers and folks like uh, Sarah and TJ and her and their team to be able to collaborate and say, no, let's change the design, make it look like this, change the color over here, make this like that. So they were a, a great help to us in designing this so we can make it really crew friendly for uh, the crew members to use the airlock from, uh, from now to the end of the space station. Okay, uh, let's see what else we've we've got. We've got a lot more people watching. Still, we got a lot of classes. This is Cassidy seventh grade class is watching. This is uh, Klein's third grade science class is watching. Um, we have a sixth grade class um, from Massachusetts watching. North Carolina homeschoolers. Um, Sarah, when when this project first came up, uh, was there one thing that sort of inspired you about it and what it, what it could do? The thing that actually inspired me most was uh, honestly the fear of the unknown. Um, this was something that had never been done before. Launching a, a commercially built uh, facility that's, that's going to have payloads inside of it. I mean, this is a whole new thing and it's something that hasn't been done and so i uh i had to think through and go okay what what all do we have to make sure you know we get right 
And after talking with Brock, uh, because he and I have become good buddies over this, um, <laughs> after, after talking with Brock a number of times, you know, we, we sat down and said, okay, what are we going to do to make this team effort a success? And, and that's the one, I, I forget exactly how Brock says it, but, you know, one goal, one mission, one team. Um, and that, I think, is what has really gotten um, has been my favorite part of this, has been the most amazing part of this, is taking this from a design on paper that we were trying to figure out how are we going to make this work through now where we are so close to getting this thing on orbit and we've had, uh, we've had a lot of fun making it, we've had a lot of fun showing it off, and we can't wait to see what kind of fun science is going to come from this. Let me follow up uh, with you, Brock, about this, because you have all those really neat little models. So, <laughs> you know, this sort of inspiring design on paper, you know, what's that process to go through? You know, because you build these models, you've got this idea. Can you just talk a little bit about that engineering process for us? Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, so literally five years ago when we kind of started the airlock, uh, it was uh, little sketches here and there on a napkin. And um, uh, luckily, I have a really great team here with me that are really smart engineers and really creative people to be able to make that happen. Now, so we start that process. And, you know, just like Sarah uh, had mentioned, it's kind of a scary process, right? You have this design. You have this idea. It's like, how are we going to make this thing happen? Um we really get motivated behind it, but then you got to raise the money and you got to get the time and you got to get the engineering team and you got to work with NASA and get permissions. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is just um, uh, what I'll call it heart and perseverance. So if you have the heart, it's just kind of like your studies. If you want to be a doctor, if you want to be, um, uh, you know, uh, some an engineer or what have you, if you have the heart, um, that's one of the most key components to be able to get through those tough times and the perseverance. You got to hang in there. I, I, I'm not ashamed to admit that, you know, a year ago or so, we were really struggling to make this thing work. We were really struggling with the engineering side of things, the fabrication, but we were able to grind through the help of, um, uh, our partners, uh, the NASA team there to help push us over the over the hurdle to get to that uh, uh, finish line. And now here we are. And I look back, and I go, man, what a great effort. And what a great team effort, an example of uh, uh, people coming together around a common goal and really making things happen. So, you know, um, that's kind of the whole engineering process. Yeah, there's lots of numbers and you got to get all the numbers right and all those kind of things. But if you have some people there to help you along the way, they can help you get all those numbers together. So everybody kind of working together has really been, and that's kind of the neat aspect of it, all the relationships. I've never met Sarah before in my life, and now we're really good friends. We joke with each other all the time. So a lot of relationships have grown from just this little bitty project that uh, we see before us today. TJ, there are people asking about uh, medical sciences, science being run on station. And I know for a fact that you all are kind of human guinea pigs when you're up there. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the the experiments that you might run on yourself as a as an astronaut? Sure, we, we, we can do that for, for sure. The, the first thing that jumps um, jumps out readily are the, the bone loss uh, studies, right? We, we're worried about osteoporosis for our aging populations on Earth. We're worried about losing um, bone mass, bone structure as we go farther and farther away. You don't want to step onto Mars and make your first famous quote to the world be an ouch, I broke my ankle, that, that kind of thing. So <laughs> we, we want to learn about that process, how to prevent it, how maybe even to reverse it. So we, we've been doing studies on that. We've been doing dietary studies to see how we um, process the nutrients that we get in a microgravity environment. Um, the other thing that, that comes to mind is readily is um, the problems or the observations we've been having regarding eyesight. And um, there, we know for a fact, I mean, it's been published in, in, in public media that astronauts, the population of astronauts have been exhibiting some um, re deformation of some structural changes in the eyeballs. 
And we don't really understand what's happening there. Um, it varies from astronaut to astronaut to astronaut about uh, how much, um, I'll just say injury, uh, how, how much uh, deformation is occurring. Um, we think it's associated with the fluid shift that occurs in microgravity. You're standing on Earth, you got gravity, it pulls, pulls everything downward. You get to orbit, and no longer pulling everything downward, and your bodily fluids kind of shift. Sometimes you see astronauts with uh, moon faces. That's because the fluid's getting up into the head. Into the head, we think there's an increase in pressure. It may change the eye shape. And th those kind of processes that we're interested in. Also, cardiac system, how is it reacting to the fluid shifts? How is it reacting to the microgravity? Um, a lot of things that we're, we're interested in making sure that when, as we go farther away, we're not going to hurt our crew members. We've got a lot of states watching. Arkansas, Texas, Pittsburgh, Wisconsin, Ohio, Florida, uh, North Carolina, North Dakota, Kentucky, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Las Vegas, Staten Island, New York is online today, uh, along with New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, North Dakota, Arizona, Indiana, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. Uh, Sarah, I'd, I'd like you to sort of follow up on a little uh, thing that uh, Brock had mentioned about uh, teamwork and uh, what kind of team it takes to build something like this and, and what kind of communication uh, needs to go on between all these different groups. That, uh, that's a great one. Um, so as far as teams, this is it takes people with a lot of what I will call intestinal fortitude um, and, uh, and patience and good communication skills. Um, it's, it's one of those where you have got to um, understand that you're not going to necessarily get everything right the first time and that, uh, that there's going to be times when you're going to have to argue with people. I don't know how many times Brock and I sat down in a meeting and, and were arguing with each other about what was the right way to do something, but, but it, it takes patience and understanding. Um, the team of people that we have, both from NASA and from NanoRax, it's, it's a huge, hugely diverse, I should say, team uh, between the flight controllers that are involved and the folks on the engineering team, the operations team at NanoRacks, the operations team at NASA, all of these different places. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's been kind of a melting pot of, uh, of different sciences and engineering and design and communications teams all coming together to, to make this project so successful. Uh, and this is a, a, a question, again, um, I think for, for Brock and Sarah, either one of you can take it. Um, what was the biggest challenge you all faced in, in designing or engineering this? So I'll, I'll let I'll Brock go there. first, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one, one of the challenges for us, we're, we're kind of a unique um, – animal here at, at Nanorax, we do things what we call commercial space. So you hear a lot of that commercial space, uh, especially with the Crew-1 launch and the work that SpaceX is doing. Uh, what that means is that NASA is trying to change the way that they've done business in the past. And I, I'll summarize it in this context in that the, in the past, NASA usually owns all their equipment. They own everything. Uh, they do all the design work. They do all the engineering. They own all the hardware. Um, now with SpaceX coming on board, SpaceX is now providing the rocket and the capsule, and they own all of those rockets and capsules and everything to take the astronauts out of space. Now, with NanRacks, we ended up uh, doing a commercial module, so we had to raise money to be able to build this module ourselves. So it's, uh, uh, and then for, so for the last five years, we had to raise money to be able to pay the engineers. We had to raise the money to build all the hardware, buy all the parts, and then um, eventually people will use our hardware and be able to, uh, that's how we get a, what we call our return on investment on, uh, on those dollars. So be able to raise the money, and especially for a very small company like ourselves, um, to be able to get that, to make that happen at the same time that we're trying to do all the engineering details. It's not simple. Um, but so that takes a lot of effort too, but the raising the money uh, was, uh, was a scary portion for, for uh, uh, some of my effort as a project manager, because I'm looking at money and I'm looking at schedule and, and the resources that it takes to make this happen. So that was definitely uh, one of the new things I'd never really 
been involved in in, in my previous uh, uh, careers and jobs with uh, working with NASA over the last 30 years. It's uh, never been on that side where kind of raising money is kind of important. So it's uh, uh, it's on a grand scale of raising money for other things like uh, scouts and those kind of things too. Well, we're running out of time. So I'm going to uh, uh, ask the final question, and this is for all of you to answer. Uh, so whoever goes first has the least amount of time to think about it. Um, in your opinion, what has been the most significant or impactful science experiment done to date on the International Space Station? I think Sarah should go first. Ladies go first. <laughs> <laughs> how did I know you were going to pick me? How, how did I know you were going to do that? Um, <clears throat> it, it's really hard to pick just one, but but I would say kind of as a group, the one that I think has been the most impactful has been uh, the vegetable, the, the growing experiments where we've grown vegetables, like TJ had mentioned, the radishes and growing the plants, because I think that's the one that's going to have the biggest um, long-term effect. And, and that's why, you know, it's so exciting to see some more of these type of experiments coming online, uh, because I think it'll help us both um, in space, but, but also on the ground, because it helps us understand growing conditions. And can we make adjustments to growing conditions here on planet Earth that'll help things, uh, help, help uh, places where typically plants wouldn't grow? Brock, so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I'll take one that's kind of kind of an odd one. One that I thought was interesting to watch is how do we, uh, as TJ mentioned, it's going to take a long time to go to Mars. These long explorations, so the astronauts are going to have to take care of themselves. I come in out of the first responder background, and uh, so being able to take care of your bodies and evaluate that, but also just the medical care. Uh, of your body. So one, one experiment that was really cool that was done a couple of years ago by some uh, middle school students, actually, we helped them with the design, but they were looking at how do you repair a tooth, a cavity? How do you repair a cavity in space? And so they actually designed a little experiment that flew within uh, one of the Nanorax frames and how you would fill the tooth in with those kind of things. And that's just one example of how do you take care of things that might happen to the crew members in space, but it was designed by uh, some kids. And uh, again, we kind of help them out, but it's a really neat experience to work with the kids there to uh, figure out what do you do with a toothache? <laughs> TJ, what about you? So let me first quickly start off and say, we want to, we're doing experiments for, we haven't solved the problem yet, but we want to get to um, anti-cancer uh, mitigations, anti-cancer medicines, anti-cancer treatment. We haven't done it, but we've been growing cancer colonies um, on different missions up on space station. Again, taking advantage of no gravity affecting the experiment, you can grow the colonies larger. On, on Earth, the colonies can, their own weight can deform the, the cancer cell shapes and therefore the processes. But up on orbit without the effect of gravity, you can be growing cancer colonies and cells um, and understand that process better than, than you can on Earth. Um, so that's pretty exciting and it would be extremely impactful if we can get to the conclusion and find that treatment. But we have successfully investigated and approached um, muscular dystrophy, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, uh, and, and we've been able to develop the medications or at least the process by which the medications can be built because of the research on space station. We are directly affecting lives on Earth because of that. Speaking of lives on Earth, let me, it's, even though it's not a science experiment, it's a, it's a demonstration. The water recycling that we use on, on board, that process that takes today's coffee and makes it into tomorrow's coffee also, um, that process that we use on board is, is that same device that we take to third world countries or disaster areas to provide drinking, potable, clear, healthy water. Um, so we're doing our best to, to not only understand processes, science experiments, but to prepare for us to go farther away and to be able to help folks on earth today. That is a great answer. Thank you all so much for joining us. Sarah, I am sorry I messed your name up. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is really exciting work. Uh, everyone was thrilled to be see Baby Yoda is involved as well. <laughs> um, 
For those of you uh, teachers who are watching, there were a lot of you. Thank you so much for watching today. If you didn't get a shout out this time around, please join us again. Uh, we will do plenty more of these and hopefully we'll get to you uh, in time. I want to mention a couple of upcoming uh, programs we have. On December 3rd, we will have an ISS downlink. We will be speaking to astronauts Victor Glover and Kate Rubens, uh, who are on board the station now, and they will be taking some questions. We also have a new STEM 30 coming out on December 3rd, uh, our latest naval aviation, uh, aviation show. Uh, we will be doing on December 10th, we will be doing a live chat with the Blue Angels. And on December 17th, uh, we are going to be looking inside the Blue Angels support aircraft, Fat Albert. So uh, we've got a lot of really great things coming up. Um, and this was a great program and I appreciate your all's time in joining us. Uh, and thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon and stay safe. Bye, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>